I think it was Colin Chapman, the founder of Lotus, uh, Lotus Cars, obviously Formula One, etc., mm-hmm. who famously said that rules are for the obedience of fools and for the interpretation <laughs> of smart men. <laughs> and, uh, I think it's a point to live by. So um, brilliant. <laughs> I've never heard that one. That is so brilliant. This is a bit of a different interview because as you all know that will follow the podcast. It's usually I have directors and, you know, artists and different things. And we're trying something a little bit differently because I've read Dan's book. All of you probably know I've talked a lot about my recent obsession with cycling and how much that's kind of changed my approach to life. And then I came upon this awesome guy who's here on the podcast. His name is Dan Bigham. And he's done some really incredible things. And his book is really inspiring to me. And so I reached out to him. He's, he's a very busy person, and but he's very generous to have shared his time with us. So, um, And I've gained a lot of things from kind of following what he's been doing and some things that's been helping my cycling. And I don't know, it's a lot, it's a lot of really cool things. And I'm personally super nerded out and excited to have you here, Dan. So thank you so much for being here. Well, thank, thank you for inviting me. It's, it's really cool to hear that you, you've got into cycling. I hadn't actually noticed from, from your Instagram. I was expecting a few more bikes on there. But yeah. Um, yeah, hopefully um, I can <laughs> it can be a bit of interest for people who are yeah usually talking to cinematographers and people who are a bit more more arty than than myself. But let's see. Yeah, no, absolutely. I think that there's just there's a lot of crossover between what we're doing here. Um, I think that the way that you approach life and the way that you uh, have approached taking things that are complicated. And distilling them down to some some degree and understanding how to manifest your own destiny is really similar to a lot of what I like to do and how I like to approach my life. So I think whether it's cycling as the goal or being a cinematographer or an artist or whatever, I think that these things are very um, connected in a lot of ways. And I, and I think it's also really important to have different perspectives in life and having different kind of things. So, but yeah, I love bikes. I love riding. I've always ridden. I didn't get a license until I was like 19 years old and I didn't ever see the purpose and pursuit of it. Cause I'm, it was like, Oh, I'll just ride my bike everywhere, you know? So yeah, <laughs> yeah, yeah I still love easy. riding too. Yeah. It's a, it's a great transport method as well. Um, it's not so much something that I use it for, but, um, uh, it's, it's obviously, I guess, the peak, the primary use of it is why it was invented and it's, it's what most people use it for. And I think sport and cycling as a sport has to recognize that, that there should be a lot more transfer to it as a transport method. And how do we save the world, really, when it comes down to it, like climate change and and its impact on, on planet Earth is pretty significant in anything we can do, especially as a sport to, to mitigate that and reduce that. And yeah, I think cycling is probably pretty critical in, in that process. Yeah, I, I, I love when I go because in America, we don't this. It's like not, no, but it's huge here and everything is spread out. So the riding to places isn't really, you know, economical. But when I go to like Amsterdam or um, cities that really like even um, the UK, when I was there last, just the, the amount of cycling that was involved. And I, he- I heard that the city's trying to reclaim streets for just cycling only, which I thought was brilliant. I think I heard it, the closer into the si- inside the city, it gets more expensive to drive a car into, which I thought was interesting as well. So. But yeah, I mean, and as a means of transportation, which is wonderful, um, you know, obviously it's a bummer when you ride in the wet and you're just kind of dealing with it, which is similar to that's basically the temperature <laughs> and the weather out there. <laughs> um, but yeah, it's it's and also being healthy and what it does to your mind. I, I don't like to run personally because it's bad on my knees and I don't have I, I can run, but it does. I like the, the act of riding. There's this, you know, I know, you know, this there's a there's this thing that happens to your zone and your mind and kind of unwraps you you know yeah which is really cool yeah there's a certain level of peacefulness to it and i find it really productive as well to to step away from from work from thinking from from forced thinking from sitting in front of your laptop to heading out on the open road and just chewing things over i find it really helpful as as a way of just finding ways through the blocks everybody struggles with mental blocks and 
don't think I'm unique in that. Okay, engineering is is probably somewhat different to just uh, some other um, problems that people have, but um, it's just a nice way to to kind of think through things. To as you said, distill them down, break them down, understand them, understand the the kind of constituent components to it. I think engineering tries to teach as a, as a practice, as something that people study, tries to teach you to understand things on first principles to to break them down to literally their constituent components so can quite literally just be a few equations that underpin and and govern whatever you're you're studying and trying to to wrap your head around and then from there i think once you understand what's happening it's the path becomes a whole lot clearer to to your end goal and yeah it's like thing as a as a way of getting that clarity can be can be really helpful and i'm very lucky i live i live in andorra i live quite literally in the ski resort <laughs> so my view right here is is mountains and chairlifts and and lovely trees so um i have a great place to ride and i don't have to worry so much about about the traffic the only the only worry for me is going up a hill and when you're out of gas it can be um a bit chewy when there's 15 minutes at eight nine ten percent to, to get back home oh damn <laughs> that's awesome yeah you're down in spain right now right yeah, so I live um, in this tiny little country called Andorra that sits between France and Spain. Uh, oh, little okay. Party. Yeah, so um, I work for Ineos Grenadiers, the, the men's world tour team, and we have I think it's about 60% of our riders live here now for a multitude mm-hmm. of different reasons. We're, we're at altitude, it's a really good thing for, for training. It's also very good from for a climber. Most most guys in the team are attempting to, to win races like the Tour de France, so being able to, mm-hmm. to go up a hill is, is fairly important to that. Um, yeah. Obviously, financially for these guys, they're running quite well, and the tax system here is definitely favourable towards them. Um, and just in general, it's a nice place to live. It's easy to get to all the races around Europe, so um, yeah, it attracts a lot of cyclists, and that's one of the reasons I'm here. And my partner, uh, my yeah, my partner, my wife, Joss, she she was very keen to come as well. She's a world tour cyclist and uh, likes racing up hills, yeah. whereas. Uh, I like going fast on the flat, so maybe it's not so much. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I was going to ask you about that. I was going to. I, what I would love to do too is is for those that don't know who you are, or are familiar with your accomplishments and the and the, and the things that you've actually done for cycling. Could you give us a, like a little bit of a breakdown as to kind of where you come from and how you became to be somewhat? You know, I know it's hard to do because you have you've done so much with your life so far, but. Where where did this all start? Like, how, how did you fall into this? Um, you know, I know you do cover it in, 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 in your book as well, but um, just curious kind of like yeah. your origin story in a sense. Try to distill it down. It gets longer every year, obviously. And um, I think there's there's a few key moments to it, really. So I always enjoyed engineering as something as a kid, whether that's Lego or Meccano or just building things. That, that was always a passion of mine and, unsurprisingly that led me through to engineering as just to study at university I, I studied most sport engineering my family all had links into motorsport or, or connections to automotive industry that kind of led me to that path I, I enjoyed watching Formula One and I thought that was that was the way I was going to go I was going to get into Formula One I'd work in the aero department preferably that was where my, my heart really lay and to be honest I got there I got there on my placement year I was in Mercedes AMG Petronas, so Lewis Hamilton and Nico Rosberg at that time, working in the aero department. And I thoroughly enjoyed it, but at the same time realized that it wasn't truly where my heart lay. In in the future, I could see that, um, so as an athlete, I was progressing. I, like you, discovered cycling and you, st- you get bitten by the bug and you start to think, well, I, I understand a lot about engineering and how maths and physics applies to, to motorsport, but also it applies to cycling. And you start to realize that those links enable you to go faster as an athlete. And at the same time, I came across uh, a really interesting guy, I guess in some ways, a similar path to me. He'd worked in, in Formula One, a guy called Simon Smart, and transitioned over to cycling. And he de- designed and developed some of the top level equipment in the sport, of Scott bikes, Envy wheels, Enduro skin suits. And um, he was conveniently placed on the same site as Mercedes Formula One team. And he kind of mm-hmm. twisted me into, into applying all that aero engineering knowledge to, to cycling and that really kick-started my my career within the sport I, I went back to university I finished up my master's and tried to really direct my my studies more towards cycling I left university uh, I worked a little bit in Olympic sport in British Olympic sport for, for British athletics British equestrian British swimming 
So basically using engineering to solve their problems and decided, you know what, let's make this big jump and, and see if I can be an athlete as well. I left that job, I set up my own company, Watch Sharp, and that's progressed alongside my cycling career where basically anything that I'm doing for myself, whether that's aerodynamic testing, whether that's research into equipment, design development, it gave me an out, uh, a, yeah, an outsource, a way to, to sell and to support myself, but also to give the sport what I was doing for myself. And it, yeah, it was very lucrative. It has continued to grow. It's a bit of a family business now with my mum, my dad, my brother, my brother-in-law, his wife, <laughs> my mate all working for the business. So that's that's been pretty cool. Awesome. But it, it kind of, let the, the racing itself led to to the, to the track, to, to velodrome racing, which I'm sure many people have come across. It's, it's quite a big sport within the Olympics. And basically you ride on a 250 meter indoor velodrome and the, the blue ribbon event is the four kilometer team pursuit, which is, is four guys. And you race for 16 laps and you try and beat the other team or go as fast as you can. And uh, it's, it's very scientific, it's very controlled. It's, it can be easily objectified and I think that's what drew it to me. And effectively, I, I set my own track cycling team up that we, we targeted that, that event specifically. We went to, to the World Cups, we, we took on the national teams and we beat them, <laughs> quite simply. And we had a really successful <laughs> few seasons. And yeah, it's kind of led one thing to another that has opened many doors. And now I'm, I've worked for the Danish Federation into the Tokyo Olympics with Ken Schramm. We won the World Team Time Trial Championships, and now I'm working for, for Ineos Grenadiers, probably the, the biggest men's cycling team in the world, trying to make them go fast. So I think in five minutes, that's That's, that's my a story. wonderful job. Outstanding. <laughs> you feel like you've done this many times, so it feels great. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. I love that your curiosity led you to things, and I love that you had this family that would support you to do, you know, your curiosities and then you briefly like kind of passed over that you have a master's degree, which is some people's biggest accomplishment. And I love your hunger. It seems like when I read your book and read your interviews and seen what you do, it's like you have this deep, uh, optimistic hunger in life. And I think it's really, it's truly wonderful when you're putting together this kind of ragtag team as you under, as I understood it, because, um, Maybe we could explain what the UCI is to people that don't know what that is as well, because there's these different, you know, rule sets that kind of work for or against your your methodologies and approaches to things in cycling. And people are very slow to adopt and uh, allow change to happen in the world of cycling as well, which is really interesting. I noticed as well, coming from the outside, looking in to be to be completely clear on my side, I just rode bikes and I loved it. And I used to ride like BMX and like all the trick kind of stuff. And that was fun. And then I got into flatland and then mountain biking. And then I tore my, my meniscus. And so I was like, I'll get back into riding again on the streets cause it's less impact. And then, and then I was like, I'll get a com I'll just get a common, common, simple bike. And then I'm like, then I got another fixed gear bike. And then I went at full on and I was like, Oh, my wife's like, what are you doing? And I'm like, I don't know. And now I have like a, I'm building a, a shiv right now, um, like the 2013 shiv. That's the frame that yeah, I yeah. and and actually, ironically, I'm 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 actually having my zip wheels delivered today too. I have the sub nine and then the 808 front and like <laughs> all these things. It's nonstop. But um, what was I gonna say? The I think uh, oh, I think it's just I, I love that you had this, you know, this passion that keeps growing and growing and growing. I loved one of the things I loved reading in the book was your your realization that you had accomplished what you wanted to as an athlete and then some and then you realized your fulfillment in watching the women on Can and Tram team and I could feel your energy and I think that's such a beautiful thing we're going to we should talk about that like cause I'm we're going to bounce all over the place but I love the idea that you went from this really high level ranking athlete and realized your pursuit is actually to be bigger, you know, to help others. Yeah. Yeah. I, th I think the UCI in many respects, so the UCI is the world governing body, uh, Union Cyclista International, and they have a long history of pushing back against technological innovation from Chris Boardman, Graham Abri, um, many of the, the ideas that they spawned, the super bikes, the carbon monocoques, etc., And it, persists within the sport they they control development at the rate that they're happy with and that frustrates me i find that really hard work i want to move at my pace and not 
where the regulations allow you to, and often not even where the regulations allow, where their intent of the regulations allow. So you can you can read rules differently. And the intent is not in a rule book. Um, I think it was Colin Chapman, the founder of Lotus, uh, Lotus Cars, obviously Formula One, etc., who famously said that rules are for the obedience of fools and for the interpretation <laughs> of smart men. <laughs> <laughs> and, uh, I think it's a point to live by. So um, <laughs> brilliant. I've never heard that one. That is so brilliant. <laughs> yeah, he's uh, he's a deep thinker in, in the world of sport. And I think yeah. he challenged a is lot. He- and I think he's a, he's definitely a character and somebody to live by. Uh, and I think I've learned a huge amount from from him as a person and, and what he's achieved. Not in, in just motorsport as well, but obviously what Lotus cars have achieved in, in the world of cycling and continue to do. Um, yeah. But I think... Having those barriers put up made me interested in trying to help others as well. It's something I'd done within my team. I obviously, as a team pursuit, you collectively are the team and you need to perform and one person is not the team. And uh, it's a great event for that. And I sacrificed a lot as an athlete to ensure that we had not just the performance, but the support needed financially and the logistics and everything that goes with that. But when yeah covid started to come around and um, other opportunities were presented then um, it was very exciting to kind of take that process that i'd applied to team pursue and apply it elsewhere and yeah canyon shram were were the first team who who approached me and were like this is awesome what you're doing how can how can we get a piece of the action and uh yeah to to be a part of other people's success is is incredibly enjoyable and rewarding as well especially when they really trust you and buy into your process and your way of doing things and yeah, canyon were absolutely the the leaders in that at least in, in in my life and then since then many other teams the danish federation and what they've achieved on the track um but yeah with the going it is now i've 32 riders to look after and each with their own ambitions and goals and how do you balance all of them and the, the team's right. collective ambitions so it's it's definitely a challenge but it's a lot a lot more rewarding when it's not just benefiting yourself. There's there's other people who are going to go out there and achieve bigger and greater things than than ever I could. Obviously, I have my own ambition still as an athlete, but there's only so much that I can ever do. If you can help 32 people achieve each wow. of their goals as well, then it becomes so much bigger and yeah, a lot more rewarding. Yeah, you're like 10x in your life almost if you can live vicariously, but you can also be a supportive aspect in a positive way to people and that that I didn't realize is 32 athletes. That's a lot. That's a lot to manage (laughs) and to handle all those egos and all those kind of, because I think sometimes with certain athletes, I would imagine everybody's a bit of a tortured, tortured soul whenever they do something repetitively expecting different results, you know? And so, and I think that there's a realm of insanity and that ego kind of feeds that. So you have to kind of navigate that. I would imagine that's got to be very difficult. Yeah. There's quite a few athletes that I've come across in my time with, that they, they struggle, they, they struggle with change. And I think you have to accept that change is the only way that you're going to improve and move forward. You, exactly as you said, it's it's insane to expect different results if you keep doing the same thing. And because they're so established within the sport, the, the dogma and that old school mindset just persists. And it's surprising actually the, the disparity between the established older riders, the kind of heading towards the end of their careers in their early to mid thirties, or even some towards their late thirties. If you compare them to the young kids coming through the 18, 19, 20 year olds, the mindset is completely different. And it goes from having to to push ideas towards athletes and to push for engagement to the complete other end where I can't keep up with the demands of what some of these younger kids are asking for. And it's great because I know that I don't have to fight for, for the engagement. I don't have to fight for them to, to take these ideas up and that's how we're going to get quicker because they accept it's, it's part of the process and if they keep doing that same old thing they're going to get the same old result and that guy's going to beat them because they're going to move forward as quicker than them i love that i love that um i mean if i i mean i don't know i guess it's a different perspective but if i was working with somebody that was repeated repetitively shaking the ground and also Uh, accelerating through things using different techniques and methodologies I'd be like you're my new best friend and let's work on this together because I want to actually increase your sharp I want to sharpen your blade as well you know and and that's how you really can I you can kind of figure that out but yeah I I didn't realize there was 32 32 athletes that's a lot to manage and a lot to kind of navigate which is really quite beautiful as well um when you're going up your parents or was somebody in your family 
interested or um, help you motivate you into the direction that you're at right now? Like, is there something growing up? You're like, oh, you know, my uncle, this and that, or I got introduced to this thing or were they just full support of what you were doing? I definitely had supportive parents in, in quite, I guess, a different way to most top level athletes. I think a lot of top level athletes have support in the sense of they'll take them to every single race under the sun, buy them all the equipment, etc which is not what I ever had. I never had pushy parents. They weren't saying, this is your sport and this is the way to go. But they were completely supportive of me trying every sport under the sun. And I did. I squashed tennis, rugby, football, swimming. I I literally played a bit of everything, but never specifically settled. And they were very keen for me to continue my studies. And they could see really that's where a lot of my enjoyment came from. I enjoyed the social aspects of sport, but I hadn't quite found what would drive me to the sort of top end within sport and what cycling has given me is the kind of tying together of my passion of engineering and and sport and how I can apply that. And I think a lot of people in cycling are in it for different reasons. Like some people love, love the outdoors, love the exploring side and they'll do trans Pyrenees races and, and crazy things like that. Or maybe some people like it for the social aspect to go to the cafe with their mates, to ride cool kit, to, to chat about, some new helmet or some new sunglasses coming out, whatever it might be in, in that respect and about the style side. Whereas for me, it's always been about trying to push myself to be better in every respect. And that's not just physiologically, but technologically execution equipment and how I can apply the nerdy side of my life to my sporting mm-hmm. side of my life. And my parents, when I kind of, I found sight thing and that was 20, I was 20, 21 really, when it, when it properly came to me, it was 2012, 2013. Yeah. So, I, uh, they, they fully backed me and um, I think they've made comments since that uh, maybe I didn't see them as much as I could have done because of everything I was committed to doing in, in the world of sport but they fully backed me in that and, and obviously joining my company to, to support that and help that to grow because without them it wouldn't be anywhere near what it was today because I, I don't have the, the resource when you spread yourself so thin and it can detract from, from your main goals and my main goals have always been obviously to achieve my performances that I want to do as, as an athlete and to help those as well that I'm working with. And um, suddenly if you have a list, yeah, 20, 25 things long, then you spread far too thinly. You don't ever achieve the things that, that you want to at, at the top of the list. So they've always been great supporters in clearing those things from the bottom so they don't fall off the table. Those plates don't stop spinning, but it means they, they get done and things keep moving forward. So I do think as well, my, my dad, he's always been passionate about motorsport. He, he raced motorbikes, jet skis, he got us into to quad bike racing, kart racing. So I think that that helped to, to really understand there was there was avenues to to apply what I was learning at school um, and to yeah give that competitive side at the same time because there's, there's kind of a few itches, sorry, a few, yeah, itches that I scratch within within cycling. And I kind of think throughout my, my life, my parents have helped me to to learn about them and to understand them. And then, yeah, at the right moment to support me completely to, to go and achieve that. I love that. I, I I love that you had that support because it makes you a better person. And I also love like the thing that I got really excited about is that you do come from Formula One because then you're applying very high level engineering concepts at the brink because F1 represents the c- accumulation of science and engineering in pure manifest being used. It's not theory. It's actually usable theory that is proven basically, which I think is so cool. And to be able to take these concepts because I love that stuff too. I'm not necessarily of course an engineer, but I love, I I just, I'm curious about it all because I love like seeing wind, you know, I have a very visual imagination so I can see how things work. And even when it looked like you guys were developing the bike for yourself, for your individual time, your individual, um, hour pursuit. And then Filippo Ghana's one as well. The like using the, the things from the whales, I forget what you call those things. Yeah, tuberculosis. Yeah, on the the seat tube, and I mm-hmm. thought that was so cool to disrupt and create um, passageways for the wind to kind of move. And I've just, I love all these things that you you guys have done, and I love that it's all marginal gains. The moment I figured, I heard that, I was like, that's a really cool term. Could you explain what marginal gains is to everybody <laughs> listening? That's yeah, basically so. your, your life, basically. Yeah. <laughs> Well, yeah, writing we always laughed and joked that we wouldn't call it marginal gains. We'd call it the uh, what was our term that we came up with? 
the accumulation of small yet significant improvements, which obviously rolls <laughs> off the tongue just as well as marginal gains. <laughs> so the, the term was found by uh, so Dave Brailsford, who's the founder of the team that I work for now for Ineos Grenadiers. So my boss's boss's boss. <laughs> so as I hope nice. you can go really, and <laughs> it is exactly what it says on the tin. Really, it, it's the accumulation of those small yet significant improvements. If you constantly add up your half and one percenters in every different area, suddenly you're not half or one percent better. 10, 15, 20% better. And it's the primary reason why Team Sky went from, well, non-existent to winning a Grand Tour in under five years. It was simply put, doing everything slightly better than it has been before. And I guess, unfortunately, you know, for us, it's become incredibly popular and well understood and well applied within not just our sport, but all sports. And realistically, that has come from, from Formula One. That is the epitome of, of marginal gains. And we're quite lucky within Ineos Grenadiers, we, we sit under the Ineos Sport banner. So every other team that is connected with Ineos, we have access to, and we, we do what was described in the book as idea sex, to have people with different approaches, different life experiences, different understandings, look at your problem. So I could go mm -hmm. to, whether it's Ineos Britannia, the America's Cup sailing team, to Mercedes, the F1 team, because they're part owned by, by Ineos, to, to the All Blacks, to Nice Football Club, to Kipchoge's Running Academy, they're, they all wow. sit under the banner and we have this great thing in your sex so we can kind of move around and to, to get different input because it's incredibly powerful to have a fresh set of eyes cast over something. You can mm. really see the flaws in things because I mean, it was a really good piece of advice actually that I got given my very first job that when you come in, write down everything that you think is done wrong, everything that you don't like, everything you think should be different because in two, three, four months down the line, you'll work around it and you'll forget that it's a problem. Mm -hmm. And it's exactly what happens in every industry, every walk of life that because you're the new guy, you don't want to go, hold on, that's not right. And then you suddenly work around it and yeah, it becomes embedded and people just ignore it. And to have that fresh set of eyes critically approaching whatever your problem is and to say, hold on, you, uh, you aren't doing this as well as you could do for these reasons. Have you thought about trying this instead is, is such a powerful thing. And it's something that I've really warranted throughout my entire career to try and do to to push to find different people it's, it's something as as a track cycling team we went out of our way to find people who weren't just cyclists they were they had their own areas of interest and then they'd apply what they'd learn but to our sport and there's so much crossover from from other industries that it's it was it's a really powerful thing that we did it, it it's something that i still do to this day and um yeah it's it's probably the biggest source of inspiration that we have I love that. I love that you guys have this inner tool that works for objectivity because you're right. The mo the mind melds and and bends to to friction, and um, if you're willing to bend to friction, basically, and if you're not willing to have that objectivity, but in order to really get into the deep parts, the deeper well of where gains come from, you have to cross pollinate ideas, get perspectives on things. That's the last thing that some of us want to do is to be told we're wrong. Cause sometimes it's hard, but when you're achieving or you're going for a goal, like in my, my work, it's a little different cause art is subjective. So beauty to you and me and everybody else is different. But when you're, when your goal is to get faster on a, on a bike, well then it can be quantifiable, which is really fun. And, and you can, you can still do it within this realm for so people that are listening to this and still hanging on to this conversation. I think like it definitely is something that you can apply to life. The marginal gain aspect, I would say like for an artist in my mind is like understanding how to really m manage your time and your resources and your energy and your creative energy and that flow of energy. Because like, if you don't, it becomes bad for you. And just in, like holistically as we, I've talked about this concept many times on the podcast, but the objectivity, this must've been, so when you were starting out, you were kind of you and your laptop, your spreadsheets, all of the stuff that you had from your schooling and education and the F1 and you're kind of applying that. I love seeing the videos of you just nerding out on spreadsheets. It just makes me so happy. Uh, and like, it's cool to see that you're like, you're quantifying things. You're having your athletes run the track and going around and you're like, oh, try this different thing. Try that. Try this position because that seems to be the bit next kind of big gain obviously is as I understand it and you know this much better than I am the bike equates to 20% of the aerodynamic drag about so and then the body is 80% is that about right yeah obviously the more aerodynamic you get as a rider the more that balance shifts but it's, it's very true the rider is is the biggest drag factor that you have it can 
you can have huge benefits from that. And I think that's where cycling <coughs> is um, is really nice as a sport. It's incredibly objective, or can be incredibly objective if you're willing to take that approach to it. And that's where there was a gaping, wide open goal for for us that the sport itself hadn't yet realised it could be objective, that it could use all the tools that were available, the technology that was being developed, that was being used in motorsport 20, 30 years prior. And then it's very, super simple equations when it comes down to it. And anybody who studied a little bit of maths or physics up to probably the age of 16 or 17 understands energy. Energy cannot be created or destroyed. It literally just transfers from one place to another pretty much. So we're producing energy or power um, and we measure that through the cranks and we can measure how fast the bike's going and a few other things. And before you know it, you can you can put a number on how aerodynamic you are, how efficient your drivetrain is, how efficient your tires are. And then once you can measure something, you can improve it. And that's that's pretty much all the process we took was, was what happens if you change a helmet? What happens if you change the material of your socks? What happens if you change the width of a tire? How does that impact on everything? And it's, it's super objective and you can move forward very, very quickly with simple science experiments. And that's all it was. It was something that you could do as a 16, 17, 18 year old kid, but it was just that the sport had buried itself into this corner of subjectivity and old school dogma. And we kind of came in, shone a light, did something <laughs> a bit different. And maybe people had done it before, but they hadn't executed, they hadn't shown that it could be done. And then it's once it's done, it's, it's blindingly obvious that there's yeah. better ways to do it. And I think that's what, what scared the, the establishment, what scared all these different nations we were coming in. Um, I mean, the first year our budget was about 15,000 pounds and that was for <laughs> four international races, three domestic races, all of our equipment, nutrition, everything accommodation hmm. the lot it was quite scary for a team that somehow we scraped by on that and could probably thank a lot of overdrafts and credit cards for, for, for bridging the gaps but when you've got nations who are spending five times that on a single race it's um, sure. and they were getting shown up by us it, it suddenly uh, put the pressure on them and i think the sport has since adopted a lot of our our ideas whether that is in relation to aerodynamic testing or even just our strategies and how we approached team pursuiting so to kind of explain the, the event a little bit more. We have four guys and three or four people, three to cross the line. So the third rider counts. And the back of the third tire, the back of the yep. third rider's tire, right? Is exactly the measurement. Yeah. 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 So you've got to get your third rider over the line as fast as possible. But people are historically just approach the problem. Well, everybody's equal. Everyone's going to do a lap turn, get to the back of the line and we'll keep going round, and then we'll cross the line and that's that. But you don't have to. You don't have to carry that fourth rider all the way. You could use a different rider who was stronger early on, and you can reduce the number of changes you do. So every time you change, you literally lose a bike length. It's something that mm. I said in quite a few interviews. And it, it, once the penny drops, it's blindingly obvious. So a bike length is one and a half meters, and we could reduce the amount of changes we did by eight times. So suddenly we're nearly a hundred meters ahead. Yeah. <laughs> sorry, not hundred meters. Sorry, ten meters ahead. And ten meters. Really, yeah. Yeah, yeah, so yeah. suddenly you're at the other team's having to ride a lot quicker for the mm -hmm. same amount of effort, uh, for the same speed, mm -hmm. and mm -hmm. at the same time, get my words out right. And, uh, well, the became, choreography yeah. of it must have been complicated, right, to get right into that pocket. So you're leading, and then you, you open up that gap, basically, for that top, that front rider. Because if you can maybe explain, because this is something that probably is a little bit escapes some of the listeners, is how this dynamic works and how you discovered this, which I think is, again, when you're looking at an image and everybody says, Hey, this is a flower and you go, oh, no, that's a rose. And like, Oh, like, you know, like, you know, you're looking at it through your own lens, your perspective of things, which I think is really important. So when you guys kind of discovered this methodology and getting these again, marginal gains, but th this is actually a big gain that you guys occurred upon what was the, one of the things that was the hardest to kind of achieve? Because I know you kind of touch on it in your book a little bit. Yeah, so there was, I guess, three aspects of team pursuit and the strategy of team pursuit that we, that we changed. So we had a rider who was very anaerobic, very sprinty, very good at short duration efforts, not so good at the, not that you can really call four minutes long, but a longer duration effort, such as four minutes. He was more suited to about a one to one and a half minute effort. So how do you best utilize a rider like that? And bear in mind, we had four riders. We we didn't have a nation to pick from. We we were four mates. We'd start a team and instead of um, yeah going out there to find different assets to suit your strategy, we had to develop a strategy to suit the assets, the hand that we had to play. So good pressure the other, cooker actually, though. Good pressure yeah, cooker. Yeah, big pressure cooker, but it made us think. And we were very lucky to have a guy called Medi Cordy come in to help us who has mm. since 
head up the the Dutch Federation who won, I think, every sprint event at the Tokyo Olympics. It was quite a scary thought how dominant they were. But he was he was very similar to us, very open-minded, progressive, not established within track cycling and willing to question the status quo. And to the other extreme, we had a rider who wasn't capable of, of getting round in a, in a normal kind of strategy. Jacob, he, he didn't, at least early on in the, the team, didn't have the physiological ability, no matter how much we, we optimised him to do what we needed to do. But they, those were the cards that we had to play. So the strategy we came up with was for me to start, to do one lap, so 20 seconds of effort, and then for the team to effectively split. So All out, flat out. From, completely from start. flat out. <laughs> yeah, if, yep. and this would get this, because I, I, I know this is common to you, but for people... So you're on a fixed gear bike. That means your pedals and your legs and your crank and everything is attached to the bike. When the wheel moves, your legs move. And when the, and there's no brakes, it's as a track bike, it's designed, it's, it's fully like just, so when you get from start from a basic stop and you got to push this big chain ring across, there's a tremendous amount of force that you have to push your body. So you do the first 20 seconds to get up yeah, to speed so- as fast as possible. If you think that we're, we're starting at zero, literally in a, in a gate, we're held and we have to get to about 65 kilometers an hour and we have one gear. So yeah. you can imagine that gear is quite heavy. So if you take your, your standard road bike, put it in the hardest gear and then try and start, that's pretty much like the level of exertion that, that we're experiencing. So yeah. it's, it's a really hard first lap. But it's, it's like it's a 60, 14, 60, 14, 60, 14 area. That yeah, kind of range. that kind of region. Yeah, yeah. It's about between a, a four to one and five to one ratio, depending on your you're aiming for and uh, yeah so I do the first one and typically I would <coughs> join the back of the line that's the normal process but there's nothing in the regulations that says you have to do that so what we decided was we want to preserve Jacob as long as we can we want him to have as much draft as possible to have an easy first half of the race so when he's in the back half he's fresher and he can perform what he needs to do so basically he created a gap in the line so I changed from first into third instead of fourth and a lot of people thought it was a mistake. Chris Borton was on commentary on BBC being like, hold on, that looks intentional though. What, what's going on here? And, and then the next thing happened. So instead of us going through the usual strategy, one lap turns, etc., we had Johnny do a five and a half lap turn. Mm. And Chris Borton was co-commentating with somebody else who I can't remember who it was. Uh, and Barrett Chris is obviously very established within the sport. He's Olympic gold medalist in the yeah, individual hour record holder, etc. He's he knows his stuff. And this other commentator going, oh, they've uh, they've lost a man early. And then Chris is like, I don't think they have. That that guy's been on the front for like one and a half kilometers now. He's not come <laughs> off at all. I think this is intentional. And then for the rest of the strategy as well, we were doing much longer turns. So instead of the usual one lap, we do three to four. So we spread the load out and do less changes because I'm going to ride on the front for four or five laps anyway. If I do it in one one turn or four turns, it's the same amount right. of energy. So the yeah. more turns you do, the more changes, the more loss. So we just reduced mm. that. So literally we had to turn each and a change each and that was it mm. and no loss. And it qualified us into, in our second World Cup, we got to the bronze medal final against the European champions and we were absolute complete underdogs. And it was just this um, penny dropping moment within the sport of the Medi method change, the long turn from from second man at it was five and a half, six laps, and then the long turn strategy as well. And um, yeah, people have since copied and, and done their variants of it, but it's become very commonplace within the sport. It's fantastic yeah. because, yeah, like another thing to maybe add on to is that when you have somebody in the front, and this is, of course, much more your wheel set, so please correct me if I'm wrong, but when the person that's leading is the one that is dynamically dancing that knife blade of destroying their team behind them. Like, cause you're dragging basically you're, you're, you're the one that's cutting the air. So you're the one that's dealing with the most friction. You're the one that's pushing it. But then those behind you are supposed to be, you know, as, as you go further back, the less aerodynamic issue basically so that they can ride with less intensity and you kind of swap them out basically as it goes. So this is really interesting that you thought of these things too. And I, I think what I love about it in the underdog story, we all love these things because if you were given all of the money, all of the resources, all the people, you would not have come up with this potentiality. I think, I think that having restrictions being pushed into a pressure cooker and finding results within yourself because the velodrome is your laboratory because it is a controlled experiment. And I think that's really quite beautiful. And it's cool that you're, 
Like I would love to do that. There's just no velodrome around here. So I can't like, so I have to ride on the road. Unfortunately, there's one in San Diego that's like concrete and it's outdoors. And it's like, that's not even a, like, I can't even like, that's not, there's wind and stuff, you know? So, <laughs> and the <this laughs> climate changes, you know, like these are things that, and in the, in the ground as well, it's like, there's too many, you might be able to get like some consistencies, but yeah. But anyways, I, I just love that. I think that's really cool. And it's cool that you guys found, who, you know, who would do what at what point and understood the, the anaerobic power and the, the threshold of everything too. And kind of in the book, I, I remember you kind of having like a play card of a top trumps or something like that of each player yes. and knowing yeah. their strengths and weaknesses of each one of your teammates and stuff. It, it's great. Yeah. Yeah. It was, it was quite enjoyable as a process. I think probably more so in hindsight at the time you're so stressed mm -hmm. because you're thinking, how, how do we, how do we tackle this? How do we, yeah. How do we do what we, we've said we're going to do that we know we're capable of doing? But how, and you'll live how together too. To together? <laughs> yeah. So we'll on and off the track. <laughs> there is nowhere to hide, which I think I do think was a strength. I think we built a really strong bond and we are all still very, very good friends years on. Good. And a lot of experiences, positive and negative, we got broken into three times <laughs> in the space wow. of a year, which yeah. definitely challenges you as people. This but, is in um, Derby, right? Yeah, we like the outskirts. obviously, yeah. yeah, the outskirts yeah. in a rougher area, shall we say, <laughs> and um, maybe it was a false economy to, to do that because we each lost um, a few thousand pounds worth of bike equipment each time we had a break in. But uh, yeah. yeah, well, track not bikes and bikes in general are so expensive because there's not a lot of people that do it. So therefore, the, the demand isn't super huge. Well, I would say uh, in the spectrum of like, you know, running shoes or something, you know, like cycling is a thing and then it gets even tighter as it goes up the pyramid of intensity, obviously, <laughs> and less people. So that like my wife couldn't believe it. She's like, how much does this cost? Like how, like, how is that even possible? Like, um, yeah, like it's more than like a motorcycle and more than most cars, these things, it's like, what the hell? Like, <laughs> yeah. yeah, it's quite scary because like, as you, you said, it's such a small niche sport really, when it comes down to it, like the world yeah. of automotive, they're making hundreds of thousands, not millions of cars. So all that R&D that goes into a car is easily spread out over that that number. Whereas a time trial bike, maybe some brands maybe only sell a few tens, maybe a few hundreds of them. So if you're having to do all the design work, go to the wind tunnel, invest in CFD, and you, you spend 200,000, 300, 400,000 on your development, then that's got to be recouped somewhere. So um, yeah, <laughs> bikes get very expensive very quickly. It's um, yeah, it's quite scary, but when you understand the economics behind it, you can fully appreciate why. Um, but it's hard, I think, as someone who comes to the sport and goes, well, I could buy a really cool motorbike or a bike without the engine, and they cost exactly the same. What is going on here? <laughs> but it's, yeah, it's hard to wrap your head around the logistics, the, the feasibility of why that's that's the case. I often ask myself, like, why the hell did I get into this? Because I'm like, oh, man, I need an indoor trainer. What? I need a computer in this. I, I'm like, man, what? it just never ends. The gear list just gets crazy. But once you kind of figure it out and once you get invested, you're just like, well, shit, you know, I'm, I'm here. I might as well just dig in and kind of smother myself in this weird debt. And then hopefully I can <laughs> pass this debt on to somebody else, you know, down the road. I, I'm trained 40 in a couple of days. <laughs> yeah, exactly. <laughs> Well, I'm turning 40 in three days and I figured, you know, this would be like a good, cause I trained jujitsu for about seven years or so and really intensely. And a lot of that mental toughness has helped me out with this as well, this individual. Cause I, the thing I love about it is it's just you, your machine versus time. And I love that cleanliness, you know, it makes my brain so happy because when I, if I'm racing against a person, that's a whole nother thing because then you have that dynamic thing, you know, that's happening, that song and dance, that, as you know. Um, but when you did your cool. individual hour record pursuit, how I thought the thing I loved about it was I watched it and I thought it was so fantastic. And then I think it was like a week after Philippe came in, like a week or two weeks after. Obviously, this seemed like it probably was by design, but I, I love that. This is another example. And I, when I watched it, I went, oh, because I was when I started going down this rabbit hole, I was starting to look at riders and I was like, Oh, this Filippo Ghana guy is savage. This is crazy. The, like the power this guy is. And he's also very tall and he kind of goes against what convention is, what we would think of as a time pursuit, which, you know, time pursuit guys, they're a little bit smaller up top and they're smaller contained so that they don't they have less drag. But anyways, he became instantly like a rider that I loved to watch. Cause he was just the, the way that he rode and this bike was so interesting all these things. 
And then knowing that he was doing that. And then I knew that I think uh, as I understood it from being a fan of both you and him, that you had helped kind of usher him through this situation and he just smashed it out, which was really cool. And that had to be a really proud moment for you as well. Both your, your hour record and then Philippe's quite recent, like quite after that. Yeah. Yeah. I have quite an obsession with our records. I've, I've done a few over the yeah, years. Just a few. And, uh, <laughs> just a few. So my wife, Josh, she was the women's world hour record holder. Of course. Uh, she lost it about a year ago. Oh now. no. So that, that was a, a fun one. <laughs> I know, I know, but um, maybe another day she'll have, have another go, but uh, not for the time being. But uh, yeah, I was involved with hers and then I joined Ineos uh, pretty much off the back of my own attempt. So I, I attempted the British record, which was held by Sir Bradley Wiggins. Mm-hmm but he'd had his world hour record taken off him by a Belgian, a guy called Victor Campenarts. So mm-hmm. he'd ridden 44.089 kilometers to beat Bradley's 54.526. She's <laughs> really bad that I remember these numbers. <laughs> no, exactly. I love it. Yes, yeah, you should. Can we explain <laughs> actually to people that might not understand it, what the hour record is and how that works so we can, when we're putting numbers to it, people would understand? Sure. So it's it's the most simplistic event in cycling, and it's much like you say, everything's within your control, which is is obviously what you enjoy about about cycling. So you get on a velodrome, and you ride as far as you can in one hour. It's literally <laughs> it's it's so pure, it's so simple. And what's interesting about it within the sport of cycling is pretty much everybody has attempted it, whether that's well, pretty much everybody within the sport, Francesco Moza. Um, Chris Boardman, Graham Abrey, or all these guys who've been top time trialists in every different era have, have had a go at the, the hour record and they've all put their line in the sand, obviously sometimes under different regulations as the UCI moves the goalposts, as it were. Um, but it's it's quite a nice one to compare back and, and very simple as as events go. I love the simplicity it's, it's of it, the purity like. of it. It's just a pure torture fest for you, isn't it? <laughs> yeah, you, you can't hide because <laughs> let's be honest, you're literally sitting there, you're going... Hey, hey, everybody in the sports cycling thing, I'm better than everybody who's gone before me <laughs> and I'm going to show you and it's all within my control. And if I fail, it's all on yeah. me. I've got no excuses, <laughs> which is quite a scary thought. Actually. I, I didn't even think about it like that. Like, yeah, that's wild that you're going to everybody and just saying I'm better. I didn't really think it, but it's true though, because like if you can pull it off and do it, you literally are the best at that thing that you're doing, the pursuit. Yeah. Yeah, because... I guess you can always argue oh, I had a bad day if, if you went to the world championships sure. and things didn't work out for whatever reason yeah. because it was on someone else's terms, the day, the course, whatever. But you pick the velodrome, you pick the day, mm. you control the atmospherics, you pick your equipment, you pick your basing strategy. It's all within your control, wow. which, okay, is scary, but at the same time presents so much opportunity for optimization. If you know the right velodrome to go to, the right equipment to use, the perfect... temperature atmospheric conditions yeah so you can really really dial it in and really optimize it and that was such a rewarding process so when i joined in oscar ideas it was something i was very clear about i knew Filippo. he'd made murmurs about having a go at the hour record and having done the british hour record i wanted to have a go at the world's before Filippo had a go <laughs> i'm not naive enough to think that could be Filippo in his battle. output is insane but because um, we gauge everything by what well, we in cycling, you gauge everything by the calculation of watts, which is the energy that comes through your body, through the cranks, and is calculated. That's how you understand it. Um, and your your watt output is quite incredible as well because, I mean, when I try to do some basic math, I was like, how's he doing that? That's crazy. But your body obviously um, gets used to this kind of position, also doing it in the position of a time trial cycling. So for those that are listening, when you're riding a bike, you're just kind of riding it. Usually your arms are somewhat stiff and straight, but a time trial cyclist, you're trying to get your body to be as conformed to the air as possible and breaking it through basically. So you're kind of hunched over the bike and your hip angle and all these things are taking a, a beating basically. So you don't have that upright position for maximum leg power. It's a different way of approaching it too, but yeah, quite interesting. <laughs> yeah, so in the world of cycling, we, we have what everyone calls CDA, coefficient of drag times frontal area. It's a common engineering term. It it's defines how aerodynamic you are as a rider. Again, you can draw a parallel to how heavy you are if you were trying to race up, say, Vontu or Alpe d'Huez or one of the big climbs. So if you're trying to go fast up there, you need power, you need watts, and you need to be light. And it's the ratio of the two that defines how quick you are. So watts per kilo is something we always talk about within the sport, at least if you're trying to win, say, the Tour de France. 
Whereas in the world of track cycling, because you're on a flat surface, weight is basically irrelevant. It has a small bearing on rolling resistance, but to all intents and purposes, the ratio that matters is the watts that you can put in, so how powerful you are as a rider, and your CDA, and it's the ratio of those two. So you can either put more power in or you can reduce your losses. Mm. And that defines how fast you go as a rider. Now, Filippo is a lot more physiologically capable than I am of putting out big numbers. Than most people, so the, the power he does. <laughs> well, he's, he's one of the best yeah. in the world, let's be honest. One of the best in, in the sport in history. So he has about 20 to 30% more power than me. But I'm a lot more aerodynamic than him. I'm slightly shorter, a little bit lighter, and have spent a lot more time optimizing my position. But my agreement when I joined INEOS was let, let me go through the process, let me do all the development, the optimization of the equipment, the wheels, the tires, the crank set, the frame, etc. So then Filippo can stick to his usual calendar throughout the year, not have to worry about the hour record and sort of parachute in late in the day and knock it out the park. <laughs> so I got to have a go with the full support of the team and he gets to beat the world hour record I as love well. That. So a win-win all around. What a smart approach too, because like again, I think this is something that I really love that I've seen with you is you have this high level optimism and positive approach to this way that you're living your life, which I think is really conducive to being a successful athlete. I mean, we you talked about it in your book too, and I agree that a positive mind, positive-minded athlete as well will achieve leaps and bounds above a negative-minded athlete who's focused on the bad side of things. So you kind of working this out like, okay, hold on. I know this guy's got 20, 30% more power output than me. So let me get this, uh, let me get this. Cause you know, as it goes down in history, you worked your butt off, you got there, you did it, you accomplished the goal, you got your record and that's incredible. And that's a massive accomplishment, you know, which is crazy. You know, um, there must've been such a celebration yeah, to do it individually because you know, when you're doing your team pursuit, there are way more factors, which is three other people, but when you're individually, like you said, it's like you're naked and there it is. You know, you're exposed and saying I'm the best and you can prove it, which is cool. And it was a scary thought to say that. I mean, if you rewind back early, just before COVID, actually, a few weeks before COVID appeared on this earth, I did um, an hour record just off for fun, shall we say, mm -hmm. um, in Derby. We were planning to head up to Altitude to have a go at the Team Pursuit World Record. And I thought, ah, oh, maybe I'll, I'll do an hour up there as well. And so I did one in Derby. I rode 52.6 kilometers. And that's a long way off the world record at the time. It's two and a half kilometers, it's 10 laps, mm. which is, I mean, it's 5% in distance, but it's it's a lot more in power. It's 1 to 1 1.05 to the power of three. So suddenly there's a lot more power to be had or you've got to improve your aero. And at the time I was like, how, how do you ride at 55 kilometers an hour for an hour? How is that even possible? Yeah. And then you flip the numbers into your spreadsheet and you go, okay, so that's how much I need to improve it by. And it's chipping away and chipping away. And at first it seemed impossible. A lot of these sure. things do. When you look at the big but thing, when you look at the big chip thing, it away. Yeah. yeah. Chip away, break down every, every area, work on it, understand more about it. How can you make a paradigm change in how something works, whether that's the aerodynamics and skin suits are, are probably one of the, the primary things that we, we work on. And they've seen huge development in the past five or 10 years to the point where you can have one suit that, I mean, take my hour record suit. If I'd picked the suit that I'd had maybe five years prior as I came into cycling, then I would have gone somewhere in the region of two kilometers less, one and a half to two kilometers mm. less. So pretty much a lot of the gains have come from my skin suit. And then everything else is just chipping away in, in different areas. And that's what's really rewarding because you feel like you make progress. And it, it's not always obvious to you at the time you, that it's all coming together in these ways. You, you kind of very zoomed in on a certain area, whether that's yeah, tire rolling resistance and understanding quite how tires work and how you can optimize them. And say so we drive train efficiency or aerodynamic flows around cylinders. So how do you optimize the fabric choices? And then you zoom all out, you put it all together and Marginal gain. you've made a big leap Marginal. forward. Exactly that. Yeah. Exactly that. I love that. I love that you found that and you discovered that through the process as well. And, and you, you know, when you looked at it, you go, how do I cut out our, and so when we're saying these numbers too, by the cha by the way, so if you're w listening within an hour, an athlete has all that they have an hour to basically, um, do the distance and the, the final distance is what it is basically. So, so if you're hearing these numbers, that's basically it, right? It's like how far you can go within an hour in the velodrome. So, and you get to pick all the locations and some at altitude and have the different, like, I, I noticed that's one thing I, I heard was a big thing that was happening with like body cooling or adjusting your body to warmer temperatures. Cause warmer temperatures is 
um, less dense air. So it's easier to go through supposedly or supposed to be basically because colder air is more dense and it's harder to cut through making it more resistance. And again, if you add the, all these things up, it might not seem that big of a difference, but a difference between a couple degrees could cost you, you know, a lap. <laughs> and then, and then if you're yeah, at the end of it, you're like, damn, scary. I'm like a lap away. And yeah, where, where's your mind at? This is something that I really wanted to get into with your mind is where's your mind at when you're coming towards the, you know, you're, you're about halfway through this goal, this hour record. As I understand it, that's when your mind starts to go, either I have it or I don't. And you either have doubt or you fulfill it and you dump, dump it in because uh, where, where's your head at? How do you prepare your mind for such a feat? Cause it doesn't like people will go, Oh, this is, he's just riding around a bunch of times. It's not, but I mean, I, I haven't rid, ridden at a certain pace and I'm like, that is so intense what you're doing. And it seems simple keeping the, the line and, and keeping straight and keeping focus. But where's your mind at? How do you overcome those deeper kind of adversities within yourself mentally? I'm quite lucky really that one of my best friends, uh, and he was one of the, the masterminds, as it was, behind all the hour record attempts. Is, is Johnny Whale? His background is, is psychology. Mm. He's he's been in the team pursuit team. We've raced all around the world together, and he's very helpful in putting together those kind of strategies that we you will use in race and breaking down into the the things that are important, the things you can control, the things you should focus mm. on. Because if you can't control it, it's irrelevant worrying about it. So, for example, I can't control how hot I am. So don't think about it. Don't worry about it. Whereas I can control the position that I ride in. So how, how tucked I am, how low I hold my head, how relaxed I am with my shoulders, the line that I ride, my breathing, I can really control that. I can keep that. If I can keep that under control, then I know I'm in a good place, but I can't control the outcome. I can't control how fast I go. I can just control all those input levers and make sure that I do them well. Mm -hmm. So we had an exact strategy for every single five minute block going through. So not just the speed that I need to ride at and getting the feedback relative to that, but also the things that I should focus on. So yeah, breathing, line, head position, and just making sure that I'm on point on every single five minute check, I'm where I need to be, because I guess the most comforting thing for me is going into that record knowing I can do it. Mm. So I'd done a full gas practice run, fully censored up back in June. This was all behind closed doors and kept quiet, but I broke the record in training. Mm. Great. And that in itself gives you the confidence. Mm. I've done it once, I can do it again, sure. but it's also, then the numbers, you we do all these different tests. So we understand physiologically what you're capable of, aerodynamically what you're capable of. And we plug it into the, the almighty spreadsheet as we laugh and joke <laughs> about. But it, it literally says it is possible. And that's all you ever need to know, I think, is Confidence. Athlete, that it's capable. Yeah. It's, it can be done. It's not going to be easy, but it's within your grasp. And then if you control all those controllables, execute the race that you're capable of, then you should achieve mm. what the end goal is. I mean, don't get me wrong, it definitely hurts. And the final five or 10 minutes, it's... How far can you go is the question. Mm. So really, what can you do? And it's making sure that you're in a positive mindset to really chase the record. It's something that I've discovered I'm, I'm really good at when I'm challenged in a positive way. So being in that challenge state of how, what can I achieve? And even in training sessions to progressively pace my intervals. So maybe the first one is a bit more controlled. The second one's a little bit harder. The third one is on pace. The fourth and the fifth, you go and find out what you're capable of. And I tried to apply that same process to my hour record. I paced it negatively. I went to halfway and I was behind mm. behind the, the current record. But I knew that in the back half, I could pick it up and that I could progressively add performance. And then you add a bit of performance, you go faster, you get the time back and you're like, okay, that's good. Keep doing it. And it's that positive reinforcement of do a bit, get faster, keep going and knowing it's capable until you get right to the end. And then it's all the taps are open and let's, let's see what you think. <laughs> you know, like uh, another thing for, that's awesome. Another thing that, um, people aren't necessarily aware of is that on, um, the, like, as I understand it too, I could be completely wrong, but on the road time trial, like cycling, um, they have a computer that's on board that's giving them their basic, like, um, watt outputs and speed and all these kind of things. But in the, and on the track bike, you're not allowed to have any computers attached to the bike. Correct. So, Correct. No feedback other than the coach. Yes. And so the coach, and this is something I think you guys also did was the iPad showing your split basically and saying like you're either above or behind and kind of getting you to look up every, every, you know, every time you come around and see and get a good feedback touch point basically, which I thought was really interesting as well. Yeah. 
yeah, so every lap we're getting feedback on on my split, and it, it's scary how precise you can modulate once you get into that effort. So I could pick a lap split and I could ride it within a tenth of a second. Mm. You, you can feel you it. Get really monotonous. And, yeah. Yeah, you can feel it, and then you hear it, and then every five minutes you get an update on your schedule. So you may have ridden to split, and then they're like, okay, you are one second ahead or two seconds mm. ahead, and hopefully uh, that helps to push you in the right direction. Mm. And it's yeah, it's it's quite nice to have that feedback and to forget about the power because I think cycling as a sport, and I'm, I'm probably bad for it as well, gets obsessed with power because it is such a useful metric. Yeah. But still, when it comes to that race day, knowing my power doesn't help me. The only thing I can do is ride at the speed needed and the power is irrelevant, whether it's 300, 350 or 400, mm -hmm. it doesn't help me. All that helps me is knowing I've got to break that record, so I need to ride this fast and therefore you've got to do what's, what you've got to do. <laughs> and manage, you, you talked about breathing, which is, I think, I, I find that cycling at this certain range, and uh, I've not done what you've done, obviously, but... I've ridden pretty hard at some capacity and I find that breathing is one thing that I'm still learning to manage. When I did jujitsu, it was all about breathing. The first year of jujitsu, you just get mopped by everybody and you're just breathing through it. And you're just trying to hold on for dear life and you get, your ego is getting crushed. And um, the one thing I learned is like breathing through the nose, which is really hard for me to do. Do you, did you exercise and develop like a good breathing technique for your breathe? Because getting oxygen to your muscles, your legs, and making sure your heart is maintaining itself. That's that's a whole, I mean, we all talk about, you know, the rims and the aerodynamic, blah, 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 the bike, but the body is the engine, really, and, and the mind and how well, how far you're willing to go into those reserves and stuff. But breathing is one of those things. How did you develop a like your, your way of breathing to maximize your ability? It's an interesting question. So it wasn't um, like a, a forced process in the sense of like I will breathe in this way so actively saying okay a deep breath in or hold or anything like that it was more a case of realizing in a practice run that the moment it all started to go pear-shaped this was one where I was like I'm going to flat split and see what happens if I blow up I'll drag it home which is going flat like out just to see at breathing. what level sorry just so I <laughs> explain it to you yeah you're listening. Uh, so basically just riders go and pick the pace for the hour record, probably to an unsustainable level, so slightly faster, mm. and just find out what happens when you reach that point, that break mm. point. When does it all go wrong and what goes wrong? So I did this in a practice run where I had everything, whether it was core body temperature sensors, skin temp sensors, biomechanical sensors, mm. muscle EMG, measuring heart rate, breathing rate, all that kind of stuff. And then you start to realize that, well, it was pretty crystal clear to me. I had this break point where it all went wrong, but my breathing went out of control. I was like, okay, I've hit maximum core temp. I was just over 40 degrees Celsius core temp and I didn't have control of my breathing. So then it became a really important thing throughout all the training sessions to focus on nothing special, just deep, clean, controlled mm. breath. And it's something I've done a lot of since, things like Wim Hof Wim Hof breathing, gonna say that. Yeah. That, breath holes. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. And I, I find it really nice to feel in control of your breath because it's probably one of the only things that you can control and um it's yeah i think it's a positive thing for cyclists to to do that not specifically to like strength train or breath train but just to be in control of breathing and there's a lot of research that shows it's it's benefit and not just from a physi physiological perspective but also like your central nervous system and to be able to activate parasympathetically mm -hmm. and the benefits from that it's um yeah, it's, it's quite scary, actually, how beneficial it, it feels to be. Anyway. Well, it's it's the gateway to your pump, basically. So it's very important. That's something I've been trying to be more conscientious of when I'm riding is um, I try not to be a, a, a mouth breather. And I heard it's actually um, really bad to be a big mouth breather. I've heard it's bad for just your body in general, which is really kind of an interesting thing. I don't know. But anyways, the nose breathing, breathing through the nose and like allowing that passageway through. That's one thing I was watching videos. And I was like, what's up with these guys with their things in their nose? I guess, what, what is that? It's like some sort of like helping clean out the, the passageway for the nose so they, they can have maximum. Yeah, to, to dilate that. So you, you've got clean clean airways really that you can maximally breathe through your nose. It's um, yeah, something that's really common in cycling and you, you often see those little strips as well that really help to, to open your Lift nose. Lift it up so you can get as, mu as much in. That's cool that you do the Wim Hof thing too. Yeah, his his whole method is quite interesting. Yeah, I would pass out doing that, some of that stuff sometimes because you can really get in there and it's like he's found a way to like do drugs with his breathing, which is interesting, <laughs> like hallucinate on breathing, <laughs> on breath, <laughs> which is fascinating. I've noticed a, 
a really strong correlation though between my ability to hold my mm. breath and my form, so my, how how well I feel I'm going at a time. So if I if I'm going poorly, then pretty much I can't hold my breath very well, mm. and it's a strong correlation. It sounds like there's there's a lot of physical things that are underpinning that. That when you're in good form and how well your central nervous system is firing, the control you have over it enables you to control your breathing or lack of yeah. and also your tolerance of low spo2 your body doesn't like having low oxygen saturation but if you're going to go full gas in a on a bike then you are going to desaturate you are going to get to the point where your body's not going to enjoy that where it's pulling oxygen from everywhere else to supply the working muscle and you become tolerate tolerate tolerating that then it's yeah it's very similar it's um, a very similar effort it seems like you've managed to really with your life and your pursuit and your and 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 building watch shop and all of these other things that you've done, you've managed to really maximize the machine aspect of it, the bike itself. And really, I, I think I heard you say that, you know, cause like I've already done the thing with the chain with the wax and all these things. And like, that was a really interesting process. My wife's like, what the hell are you doing? I have like a crock pot and I'm dipping the, we should actually, let me explain what this is for. So a chain has all these moving pieces. Actually, you should explain it. It's much better that you explain. It. I don't know why I'm it's even saying, but yeah. can you explain the waxing of chains and why people do it? Sure. So historically chains have had all manner of, random lubricants and friction modifiers thrown in them and i think it was an american called jason smith who first figured this out that paraffin wax is a very good lubricant for the pressures and temperatures that you experience in in a cycling drivetrain so yeah a chain as people probably know if you've looked at a bike has a few links and pins and rollers <coughs> and there's a lot of moving parts and they all have they're quite small and have high pressures and paraffin is a really good as a wax really good lubricant for it so typically what cyclists do nowadays is they get a chain maybe they've run it in for a little bit they thoroughly clean it so they have like an ultrasonic bath or i have one of those um, too some denatured alcohol <laughs> yeah <That's> so stupid <laughs> <laughs> yeah i mean they look very um very dodgy sitting in your couch yeah. what is that thing and that 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 yeah. thing cleans so if people understand that ultrasonic cleaner it uses um what does it do it's like it kind of blasts um it goes into like the it's cavitation. That's right, yeah. So you, you vibrate the liquid, creates um, a bubble that contains in a vacuum, and as that vacuum bubble collapses, there's a high pressure jet that then is created at that point in the liquid, which then helps to clean whatever's stuck on the, the surface of whatever you're trying I to need clean. You. So jewelers use it quite a bit for jewelry. Yeah, yeah and glasses and stuff. I need you to be with me everywhere when I explain things because you do so much a better such a better job. So yeah. <laughs> Okay, sorry. So, because I know you're jumping over things, and if you're if you're listening, you're like, "What is going on?" But okay, that's an ultrasonic cleaner as well. So, paraffin wax ultrasonic cleaner. Sure. Okay, these are marginal gains. So you clean your yeah. chain. <laughs> you whack it in your in your paraffin wax that either is in a heated ultrasonic bath or a crock pot or slow cooker, whatever you want to call it. You submerge your chain, and basically the hot wax is all molten, and it it, it penetrates into the chain, and then you hang it to dry. It's There's sets. a tungsten in there as well, uh, isn't there? Material. Typically, yeah, there'll be a friction modifier or two. Tungsten disulfide uh, is pretty common. Uh, PTFE is obviously pretty common as well. And other companies are going down well, all manner of different friction modifiers <laughs> out there. You can <laughs> you can get pretty much anything put into a chain wax nowadays. <laughs> yeah, and and then what does this do? This 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 waxing of a chain. So for because of people that would be like, oh, why would you care? But yeah, what does this do? The mm -hmm. So it reduces the friction within there. So if you, all those little points that are contacting on each other, as you're producing power, there's a force applied there and they're moving. So there's a velocity, force times velocity is power. If you reduce the coefficient of friction between all those moving surfaces, as a lubricant does, then you can reduce the loss in the drivetrain. So if you had a really poor lubricant, you might be pedaling at, well, let's say you're putting out 100 watts, you might lose five, even 10% of that if you had a terrible lubricant. So if you think 10% of the power you're using, gone. Yeah. Whereas if you really heavily optimized all your drivetrain with a wax chain, with ceramic bearings, make sure it's crystal clean and you pick the right materials, you get that loss down from that five to 10% to the one, two, two and a half percent region. So suddenly huge amount more power is going to the back wheel and that means you go faster for the same amount of marginal effort. gains again. And so, um, the last thing I remember hearing you say is that with body position, frame 
manufacturing and all this stuff, especially the bike that you used. And then also Filippo Ghana used that, um, um, uh, I'm drawing a blank. It's got a big name, so I can't really think of it. And it's a very, the Bolide kind of concept. Bolide F3DHR. It's beautiful. I mean, it's, I'm sorry yeah, Pirello, if I said it it's wrong. Fan, it's, 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 it's a fascinating, <laughs> and I love companies like that who go down that rabbit hole and engineer this work of art basically and do it for the sake of rising the bar and setting the mark, which is really fascinating. But what I heard you say recently, the last thing I think I remember you saying is that the last kind of uncharted gain territory that you're kind of exploring is tires and um, friction on the road and those different variations and variables. Because obviously a velodrome controlled situation is different from a cobblestone street for the Tour de France and these other obligations that bikes have to put themselves and the athletes through. Is that something that you're still kind of diving into or do you feel like there's other potential spots? I mean, this is your secret sauce. You've been wonderful at sharing a lot of these things, but is there another like uncharted territory? Like, I really think I could go here with this, you know? (laughs) Yeah, it's a good question. Actually. I think that there are a lot of tires. I really enjoy. I, I think by trade people think of me as an aerodynamicist, but, um, I studied engineering and aerodynamics was just, one area of that and uh, I always love vehicle dynamics and the vehicle dynamics modules at university so understanding springs dampers tire dynamics etc and even in the world of, of Formula One tires aren't that well understood they're quite complex and very hard to model when you're looking at grip and and how it creates that and in the world of cycling it's much the same what a tire actually does is is pretty damn complex when you're thinking about it deals with obviously creating grip that's its primary purpose um, but also it's your only source of suspension realistically mm-hmm. and how do you optimize that balance between grip suspension aerodynamics because obviously the tire influences your aerodynamics of your yeah. wheels um, it's a rolling resistance as well obviously you don't want to you don't want a slow grippy tire you want a fast grippy tire so how do you optimize how do you square that circle on all of those mm-hmm. different variables and really trying to just understand it to be honest we have a really good partner in Ineos Grenadiers to with Continental one of the biggest time manufacturers yeah. in the world and they're super open with with what they do and how they do it and uh, it's not something I profess to be um, incredibly knowledgeable on I'm, I'm thirsty for, for more knowledge every day on that and it's one thing I spend a lot of time really trying to understand uh, but I think cycling in general there are a lot of stones yet to be unturned I, I think the main thing is uh, the UCI allowing us to, to push the barrier of the sport even further mm-hmm. they they have their rule book it's very arbitrary in how the lines are drawn on what you can and can't what would do. you love and to see them do um, the top two things you'd love to see a change in to allow for the technology to actually permeate and to get bigger results so I guess number one probably is the main thing I would like them to do and I think I would be shot if I said this in a pro peloton is to increase the weight limit. So currently they they say a bike has to be at least 6.8 kilos, which is quite hard to reach anyway. I'd like them to say it could be 10 kilos because then suddenly, it, because everyone's on the same level playing field, easily we can hit 10 kilos. So that means you can put on cameras, you can put on all these different sensors, you can create profiles and designs that are structurally safe and sound, but incredibly aerodynamic or have complete other functions that we've never even considered because you've got this big open box. But as soon as you say weight needs to be 6.8, then suddenly weight becomes a driving factor in your decision-making process and you don't get to do all those fun things. So I think that would be number one. Number two, <laughs> um, I guess number two, the rule would be for them to write a rule book that is purely objective points lines planes intersections and not full of gray wishy-washy subjective (laughs) interpretation because that is so frustrating as rule books go is it legal is it not if it's written in the rules and you can read the rules slightly differently that means you get an advantage i think that should be fair game but unfortunately that's not quite how they enforce them Mm. right now so they're the two changes Mm. i would go with yeah so i mean it's it's also good too because if you think about it it's unfortunate but at the same time it gives you a person that has this ingenuity and this un, uh, reverse engineering kind of concept to then take the rules and just like you were using the quote from the the guy that created Lotus, it's like being able to take the pressure and unravel it and see what you can get through it, which I think is really interesting. I think it's also a, a, another big uncharted territory with your 32 athletes, I imagine, and yourself included, 
that's 33 and whoever else you're helping, but is the body machine, you know, the machine of the body, the mind and how much time that you do spend with your athletes in order to like really engage their mind to think positively and to get through these potentially. Cause like we all suffer from different things. I think that I think I know you mentioned in your book when your teammates suffered from anxiety pr- before races or um, one of them had a pretty bad crash where it broke their collarbone and was hard to get back onto that like positive open mind when getting on the bike and stuff and overcoming those things. How much is the mind and body in your mind? Obviously it's it's huge, but like mind over matter or the body can overcome. Have you encountered that with your athletes and yourself as well? Or it has to be in harmony in order to achieve the highest result. I I don't think you can ever think yourself into winning a race that you're physically or mechanically not capable of achieving. I think the result has to be possible from from a purely physical perspective. Can you produce the numbers and do you have the drag required to ride that speed distance, go up that hill as fast as you need to? (coughs) But that's only half the problem, realistically. Just because you can do something doesn't mean you've done it. You've got to go and execute. And I think there was a good concept that was taught by a a really good uh, engineering friend of mine of um, a window of performance. And we think about that in in motorsport a huge amount. How often do you get the the tyres into their performance window, their temperature, et cetera, their pressure? And is the car working in its performance window, certain ride heights, and et cetera? But cycling is a lot different because it's harder to say, is is a rider physiologically in their performance window? And, and what metrics and measures do you put on that to make sure they're in that window? Um, I think it's, it's easy nowadays to, to measure things. I mean, like smart, I have an aura ring, I measure heart rate variability, resting heart rate, etc. But is that important? Does it matter? Is that a critical performance determinant? And how do we get you into that window? Is it a certain type of training? Is it discussion around your performance and how you're going to achieve that? Um, there's, there's so many different factors and because with this kind of squishy bag of meat that is a bit of a black box. Squishy bag of meat, I love it. (laughs) Don't call me a squishy bag of meat, uh, I'm just kidding. (laughs) I got bones in here, man. (laughs) Yeah, (laughs) Yeah, there's so many variables. Yeah, if we only had squishy bags of meat, it wouldn't be as fast. But yeah, it's it's how do you you optimize them? How do you get them all into that performance Mm -hmm. window? How do you make sure the athlete knows they can achieve it, how they're going to achieve it, what they, what steps they're going to, going to take, whether that's in training, in preparation, in travel, in warm up, the music they listen to, uh, what they think about during their effort, what do they focus on? Um, all those kind of things put you into that performance window and it's trying to make that window as big as you can. So whether that's making you as efficient as possible from an aero perspective that you can always achieve those results even on a bad day or from a physiological perspective having more headroom to to go and achieve that or being more durable in pressured environments let's say you go to a team pursuit competition and it's the the world championships but you qualify poorly but you know you can win how do you tolerate that how do you turn that around how do you have a positive mindset when things aren't going so well. How do you address the things that you know are going to turn you around? Having all those tools in your tool set. So when you get throwing those curveballs, you can respond to it in a good way. And it's not always easy. It's, it's great to sit here and on a podcast just talk about, yeah, if you have a bad time, just put a happy Suck face it up. On. It's like, yeah. well, no, that's not really That's the not the mechanism either. Yeah, the solution yeah. is that mm-hmm. you've got to know what to address and, and how to think about those things and have those people around you to help raise the morale, to, to look at those issues to give you a bit of perspective to to help you be in the state that you need to be to perform and i think yeah that that performance window is is one that i always try and try and consider um and try and use the people around me to support that so my coach is a great asset for that what do i need to eat drink how do i warm up what do i think about what do i do with my spare time in competition all of that stuff puts me in the window i need to perform and stops me from doing the things that are detrimental to that because you might think oh i'll just i'll just look at my phone and it's 11 30 at night and you should be going to sleep mm-hmm. and putting those barriers in place to really really optimize that performance i think is, is super great mm, i love that yeah sleep is is massively important huh yeah <laughs> that's my biggest problem yeah. my personal goal since i'm just a novice and i like to ride my goal I've set for myself is to do 10 miles in under 20 minutes and I've gotten to 23 minutes. So I have three minutes to cut off and and this is before I have this new bike. So I'm like, "Ah, maybe I could get there. So (laughs) do you have any advice for a novice like myself or somebody that might be listening that 
is because we, we all obviously not all of us can achieve these things or live in these bubbles that you guys have, which are awesome. But yeah. <laughs> Um, I mean, other than reading the book, I think that can be quite helpful in having a goal. Yeah, yeah that's true. <laughs> Start at the book. end. Here you go. Go out there and purchase it. Yeah. yeah. But I, I do genuinely think it, uh, something like that, the 20, 20 minutes or 10 miles on a bike is, is such, it's an achievable goal, but it's not easy. Mm-hmm. I think that's that nice sweet spot of it's definitely possible and it's understanding what it's going to take for you to yeah. do that. What power are you going to have to put out? What drag do you have to hit? What course do you have to ride? What conditions do you need? How do you get to pace that effort? All the things that you have to do on the bike, holding your position, picking the right gear at the right time, all that kind of stuff. It's all within your control, but it's breaking it down, understand it, put your plan in place, go through the plan, improve, measure the things that, that are going to help you to get faster, measure your power, measure your drag. And yeah, go go out there and go and achieve it and just step on through. <laughs> I love that. Yeah. <laughs> you, you And a couple more questions and I'll let you go. Um, I know that your beginning of your career and your journey has, was kind of identified as an underdog and now you're working with the best potentially, you know, um, are the best in the best. How have you adjusted yourself to working with this massive library of talent and the task that's at hand to manage these things? How did you, how have you been able to take it from the underdog perspective to now a quote unquote high level professional? be lying if I said it wasn't challenging. I definitely have found it hard to move from a mindset of, I know how to win, I know the levers I can pull. Whereas now we don't have one goal. We have not even the 32 goals, right? So we might have two, three goals a year and the team may have different goals within that. The sponsors, the limitations they can sometimes present and the opportunities they can present as well. It's understanding the complete lay of the land and then trying to think, okay, how do I best navigate this to bring as much performance to the primary goals that we have. And it's it's been a real challenge, I must admit, because it's it's such a different ball game to, to what I'm used mm-hmm. to. And I think um, my boss, he, he described it really well, where basically you're flying a plane whilst also fixing the plane and trying to improve the plane <laughs> all at the same time. And it's, it's quite a, a complex problem because every other week I have a race to go to. I've just come back from, from Paris-Nice. Um, I'm probably heading to, to Italy next week to another time mm-hmm. trial. So I'm, I'm on race trying to action performance. Then sometimes I'm having to, to fix issues, whether that's mechanical issues or exec- your problems that we've had in time trials or whatever it might be, just having to fix the plane. But then also all the time and trying to do the interesting thing, which is to make the plane better. How do we, how do we improve? How do we move things forward? What's on the horizon that I should be looking at that realistically we should be implementing? And I think my background in motorsport has helped a huge amount with that because where we are in cycling is where most sport was 20, 30 years ago. So basically all I have to do is look back. Oh, what were they up to? That's a good idea. That. <laughs> <Nice>. <laughs> okay. That's a bit overly sure. simplified. Yeah. It's, it's, yeah. <laughs> that's good. That It's good to know that it's a challenge for you because it seems like you're a person that likes a good challenge. So it'll keep you busy and that's good. You know, like managing through it. I love that analogy of the plane too, which is really fascinating a concept as well. And your role in this kind of a machine what is your technical role that you like the title that you're given or that you tell people that when you're doing this so my t- i think people jump between performance engineer and race mm. engineer which is i guess a bit of both um but it's it's trying to bridge the gap between riders and everything that goes on behind the scenes so i'm a bit of a, a conduit for for knowledge for implementing solutions to all the problems that they have so because I'm still a rider, I'm still racing. I still race against these guys. I mean, my teammate on, so I'm on the, the British Cycling Olympic program now wow. as well, which is a whole other <laughs> side thing towards the Paris Olympics <laughs> that my teammate for that is also the guy that I work for in Ineos Grenadiers and Ethan Hayter. Hmm. So I'm helping him to get faster through my job, but also his teammates. Uh, it's an interesting dynamic. Um, but yeah, I, I sit in that middle ground as an athlete and an engineer, so I can, I can talk engineering to to partners, to equipment manufacturers, et cetera. But also I can talk cyclists to the guys who want to know, well, how does this feel to me? What does it actually mean to me if they can't talk in CDA, drag, Newtons, Watts, Jules, <laughs> they can, they can get it in, in their They can't language. speak spreadsheet. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> I'm trying. You, can you talk a little bit about Watch Shop? And, and, and I know you mentioned now it's like a family 
thing. This is another endeavor of your quite packed in, in con- condensed life. But what what's going on with that? What's that pursuit all about? So as I said, it was originally an outlet for the things that I was doing myself, mm-hmm. aero testing, equipment design, etc. And it just continues to grow. It's arms and legs now, as I said, with it being a full family mm-hmm. endeavor. Um, I'm still involved, albeit more at arm's length. I, I don't take a day-to-day involvement in actually running it. I tend to guide a lot more in the direction we should go, what should we develop, who should we work with, and what does that look like, and try and join the, the dots up. There's a lot of people I've come across within the industry at, at races and competitions who are interested in our products or in a new product or a new design, and I think I try and bridge that gap of, oh, we can definitely help you with that, here you go. And We've partnered with with World Tour teams, pro continental teams like Uno X. My partner Josh, she rides for the women's team there. And we support them as as a team with aerodynamic components and, and testing and general consultancy. And I think in general, I, I I want Watch Up just to be the leader in doing things well, doing things right for the right reasons, and supporting British engineering, doing things logically, objectively, having the fastest, best components to enable people to achieve the performance that that they want to do. I love that. And it's so cool that you and your wife are so synced up with these pursuits and goals because it is a, a very intense life. I'm sure the traveling and the, um, the obsessive nature of it to gain and acquire these things, it would probably be really challenging to have a marriage that didn't support such odd behavior. <laughs> Yeah. <laughs> yeah, we uh, we definitely sit on the same plane in that respect. We even manage our our logistics and our time scales all through um, through a spreadsheet. We have Google That's Sheets. Fantastic. So where where's Josh going to be? Where are we <laughs> together? What's coming up, etc. It's um, yeah, spreadsheets left, right. Big so congrats so. to her. She's amazingly accomplished too, and that's a huge that's a huge feat too to be able to do that as well. So that's really cool. So pass my regards. That's awesome. Um, last thought I was sure, going to say you. I thought it'd be interesting is for you to share potentially what you're doing next then something that you're really excited about or a goal that you haven't obtained that you really are are searching for and then um any advice you'd give your past self or somebody that um it doesn't have to be about cycling or it could be anything but like something that you could have given yourself that could have really helped you overcome something you know uh, some sort of word of advice so two questions and packed into one yeah so for me that there, there is one guiding light goal that I have uh, and that is to, to win the Olympics, to win the team pursuit at the Olympics. I feel I have unfinished business there. I worked for the Danish Federation into Tokyo Olympics. We went in as favourites. We qualified fastest. We won the rounds. We got to the final. We led all the way until the last half a lap and we lost. <laughs> and that really like, hurt. <laughs> that hurt. Shoot. <laughs> yeah. I know. Um, that must have taken a couple of weeks to deal with. It's quite nice. <laughs> Yeah, it's, it was probably the most stressful 48 hours of my life, I've got to admit, mm. <laughs> in a lot of respects. Mm. Um, so yeah, that that is unfinished business. And it, it's nice now that I'm an athlete competing for the national team, that things have changed now, the door's open to me, I'm within the programme and I'm on the, the conveyor belt, as it were, towards Paris Olympics. So for me, that is absolutely my primary goal. And everything that's hit before then is, is literally... Uh, a stepping stone towards that. So whether that's Nations Cups, whether that's the World Championships, it's um, yeah, all towards getting to the Olympics in peak form with the most optimised setup that collectively as a team we can have and to go and win there. And uh, that's, I guess, that's the big goal. Um, in the middle term as well, I've also I've got my first child popping out oh. in about four months. Oh man, so. that's why you mentioned she can't do you doing yeah. it. Okay, great. That's good. Congratulations. Yeah. <laughs> Wow, that's going to be a game changer. That's quite exciting. (laughs) How old are you? I'm 31. Yeah, wow. Here it comes. Yeah, big change coming. (laughs) It's amazing. (laughs) Yeah, so uh, that's definitely a curveball towards it, but uh, I'm excited. I'm excited for sure. It should be good. That's fantastic. (laughs) Wonderful. It was so nice to meet you, and, and thank you so much for your time and doing all that you do for the sport and um really just i don't know it's 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 really wonderful to meet great people that are really pursuing their own dreams and goals and i think hopefully those that are listening understand that there's a different way of pursuing your goals and your dreams and they're all kind of universal it's just the human story basically is overcoming adversity and um so yeah i definitely appreciate you thanks for 
they're awesome book. And, um, yeah, everybody listening, please go purchase it and support Dan and what he's doing. And yeah. yeah. Thank you. Thank you for having me. It's, it is always enjoyable to, to talk about things. It, it gives a lot of perspective as well, just to reflect back and to think about things that have, have gone before and, and what's coming up and to talk about it as well. And yeah, it definitely helps the process think of new ideas and to keep moving <laughs> forward. So thank you. You're very welcome. That. It's podcast therapy. This is great. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you, Dan. You have a great day. Cheers. Cheers.